Whether you are thinking about becoming a restaurateur or you are already in the business, Michael Politz has written a must read, The Food and Beverage Magazine's Guide to Restaurant Success. Pick up your copy today at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Books A Million, or wherever fine books are sold. Food and Beverage Magazine Live, bringing food and beverage to life with your hosts, James Beard Award winner Jennifer English and Food and Beverage Magazine publisher Michael Politz. Featuring leaders in the hospitality, branded food and beverage, and CPG industries, many of whom are Jennifer and Michael's friends in the business. For an informal and informative conversation where friends in the business share the latest intel, ideas, and best practices. Live, juicy inside scoop from the tastemakers, newsmakers, bread bakers, drink shakers, spoon lickers, clam diggers, farms, foodies, and friends of the food and beverage magazine world. Here are your hosts, Jennifer English and Michael Politz. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jennifer English, and I'm the editor-at-large of Food and Beverage Magazine. And I'm very lucky today because Michael is on some tropical isle. No, really, I'm lucky today because I get to do this conversation with one of my favorite women in the industry all by myself. And I'm saying that because I'm greedy. I admit it, I'm absolutely greedy for conversation and time with the extraordinary guests that we have today. The Women's Hospitality Initiative started just before the pandemic broke in 2020. At that time, they had an important message for the world, and that was that in the world of restaurants and hospitality, while women make up 50% of each of the culinary school classes, only five to seven percent of the leadership across the board in food and beverage is made up of women. Why is it so hard for women to rise to the top? Why is it so important that they do? And how incredible is it that today one of our guests is just one of those women who has not only made an extraordinary impact on the world in every dimension of it which she is in, but she teaches us all so very much in addition to caring for us and cooking for us and teaching us, she does so much. We're gonna start by talking about the blue zones, those incredible places around the planet that seem to have the secret sauce for helping us live our best lives as our best selves. All of this describes Nina Curtis to me. She's been active in her leadership in every dimension of the food world, from her participation with organizations like Women Chefs and Restaurateurs to all of our favorite organizations and, and events. And it's really a pleasure. You'll recognize her, of course. You've seen her on TV so very many times. But perhaps you don't realize that the impact that she has most substantial is that which is what we're eating that you might not realize has a direct connect to her. We'll get to the bottom of that when she joins us. Nina Curtis, Chef Nina Curtis, excuse me. Welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm wonderful, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. How are you? You know, I'm really excited to have you here. I'm greedy for this time with you. And I hope you don't mind that I started by connecting you to some of the organizations that I know we both care about that are helping to increase the numbers of women in leadership positions like the job that you have. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you are much more than an executive chef. You really are a visionary. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have a technical title, but I'd love to be able to introduce you by imagining <laughs> what kind of job you have in the sense of what you've gotten to do to change the way we think about food. Because we, we are getting out of the past in food. We're growing and coming into the future of food and food 3.0. And I wonder if the job that you have right this minute would have a different title if you could give it a different language today. How would you describe or title your job today mm -hmm. versus in previous to 
food 3.0 in the old, you know, sort of like the old web two world and the old, you know, traditional world. Cause I, I wanted to start with this idea of how not only the position has changed, but how we have changed in our relationship and understanding about food. I know that's a big complex idea of a question, but I was really interested in, cause you know, I'm famous for my introductions. And so I wanted to give you the chance to help me understand how you need a new introduction. You understand? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. You know, I would envision I'd be a wizard. Oh, isn't <laughs> that fantastic? I, I'd be a wizard in uh, Web3 because I think that's what we're gonna be. Yeah. And the work I already do, sometimes I think it's wizardry because people think, oh, you're just steaming carrots or whatever. But there's so much magic in the cooking. There's so much magic in pulling vegetables and fruits, especially at this time of the summer, right. out of the ground. And so I would say wizard of culinary imagery, wizard of culinary envision, wizard of culinary, whatever you can think you can have and taste and enjoy. You, of course, one of the world's leading voices in cuisine to live for. You don't ever say something is so delicious, like, oh my God, that's to die for. You say it's to live for. And you are very vocal and very positive and very joyful about cooking with a vegan approach. There is a, a intense attention being paid to plants and the role that they will play in our future. The world is rising to meet you, Chef Nina Curtis. Yeah. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm excited. And, you know, it's 20, over 20 years in the making that I've been on this path. You know, because we know each other. My dad's a chef. I didn't come out of my mom plant-based. And so I know the world of food. And I know all of the richnesses it brings. So I respect that. I respect that training. But I am excited that, you know, more people are realizing, one, plant-based is food. And there's so much to be joy, enjoyed with it. You know, if you don't have what is the typical defined protein um, on the plate, because all plants have protein. The title, The Botanical Chef, is an yes. important one because it really speaks to this moment in time. How did you become the botanical chef? You know, I was doing a pop-up dinner and so often I've held positions in, you know, day to day, my day to day work where I was an executive chef or director and executive chef. But I've always loved to do pop up dinners. I've always done fundraisers. I've always done events. And I needed a name because it didn't seem right to say, well, I'm the executive chef of this place, but I'm here doing this. And it was mine. So I yeah. didn't want to misrepresent the company I worked for because it was on my own time. And so I felt it was right to have my own. I've had my own business before. So I came up with the name Botanical Chef because this is years ago. I didn't want to put just plant based on it. And right. botanical seemed just so much more open and exploratory, just like we're talking about Web3, right? right? Wizardry. And so some people thought I dealt with plants and flowers. But this really offered me the opportunity to not have borders with what I did. And I came up with the name. I got business cards. I set up my basic catering business and pop up. And it did really well. It does well. Talk, can we talk a little bit about this moment in time and emerging from the pandemic into food 3.0, mm. the future of food? It is obvious to say that plants are going to be a substantial part of our future. How can you plant a seed with this audience that's going to allow us to really understand what that actually means, what you want it to mean? Hmm. You know, I, I, I love, I always go to Alice in Wonderland. And that just always represents to me what my world of food is. There's a show out there called Crazy Delicious. Yeah. It's a BBC show. 
And that just is my, like, I'm right there. And so for me, I know all the benefits that what I do offers. I know um, my compassion for animals, you know, but I, I think we can still come together and I can bring foods that people are like, I always get Jennifer. I just didn't know. I just didn't know this could be so good. And, you know, when we think about Web3, I just imagine that people are going to come in with more of an open mind to things. And so the magic that can take place in Web3 and, you know, we've talked about it, getting the taste, the color, the smell, the sound, all the senses involved. That's what I'm looking forward to as I continue in the future and what I try to deliver. One of the things that I think we could do as a service at Food and Beverage Magazine, which is a trade publication, over 14 million members of the food community and the food industry, which is at its core a service industry, join us every month and, and read our articles and watch our shows. So I really keep them in mind. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a transitional period of time when we went from a very meat-centric, protein-centric plate and tablecloths and fine dining to this transitional period where excellence in food is no longer exclusively found in fine dining restaurants. Excellence in food, as we just saw with the recent James Beard Awards, can be found in a taco place in Philadelphia or in a pizzeria in Phoenix. It's yeah. everywhere. So now that we've begun to redefine excellence in food, we're ready in some respects. Mm. And yet, we have to talk about the fact that you're asking us to imagine an entirely new world of food. No one wants to give up delicious, but they can't yet imagine how to be the host we want to be, to say all are welcome at my table. I'll make you what you need. And I want to respect what that is. We're all going to have to learn aspects of this. Mm -hmm. And so it's inevitable, and we have you. Given that setup, given that this world is changing, what can we share with our audience so that they don't feel like it's a limitation or a constraint to have to cook plant-based, but rather the greatest invitation to the biggest freedom they've ever had in the kitchen? Yeah. You know, plants are already on the plate. Vegetables are already there. There, There is rarity that there's just this five pound slab of meat or even two pound, right? So I think we have to, terminology is important because we always refer to vegetables or plants as sides. So I think we have to allow um, vegetable forward to be normalized, vegetable, um, you know, emphasis on vegetables need to be normalized. I think people say, well, why would I pay that much for vegetables? But we know through this season how when we don't have things, we have a little bit more respect for it. And the people that are out there in the fields producing, I, I think there is more understanding, there's more interest, there's more respect and regard for where our food is coming from. Because before this um, season, as I like to call it, I don't like to give it a lot of energy by any other name. I, I think we just were disassumed that food came easily. So I think when we, we put that emphasis, um, the thing that plants can do, they can color the plate right. and we eat with our eyes. So there is so much fascination, I find, when I make something as simple as the guacamole, or guacamole as I call it, and you, you put a flower petal and, and you place, placement is everything for chefs. So I, I don't think it's so hard, but I mean, we are a human being, um, a society that wants what they want. Right. And Cravings I just think it's important to lead with compassion and lean into people and let them try it. Not everybody is on the same journey at the same time. I just did a two day presentation with a group called Plant-Based Prevention of Disease. I'm a board member and we oh, wow. talked about chronic 
kidney disease. And it's a big deal, but there are ways to prepare foods to help people as food is medicine. And so I hope in my work and my vision and my mission, I catch people before they ever get to that point because there's enough out there, enough studies to substantiate, you know, the challenges that certain foods we really are drawn to can cause problems for us down the road. So I understand food for sustenance, I understand food for entertainment, I understand comfort food, but we can all enjoy these things. And I just think it's exposure. Every time I get up, I didn't know that keeps me going back to the drawing board. Let's use that kidney example, as you may or may not know. I am a survivor of a very rare form of kidney cancer. And so I would love to eat no. to keep my kidneys happier. I, I will connect you. Yes, I, I will. Okay. I'll but, give you but that for people that are listening as a way of an example, is there something simple that we can at least keep in our thoughts about ways that we can use something simple like... Yeah. Like well, one food that does many things or specifically for kidneys or specifically for the heart. You know, when we start thinking well, of about course, this I don't medicine, make any medical claims. I'm not a doctor. And right. I, I make these same statements when I'm presenting to physicians and uh, registered dietitians. But salt is a huge concern, right? So we're going to be concerned with sodium and potassium. And we've always been taught, oh, we need a lot of potassium. But in this renal situation, that is not the case. For example, I made a dish that had quinoa. And then I added to that leafy greens. And then we had a tahini sauce that I made. And then I put some fermented beets because beets have shown to be really good for blood pressure and other things that are connected there. And then I did roast, just dry roast with a little sea salt, just a little bit no oil added, some sweet potatoes. And so oh. there is a lot of new information coming out of even past a decade, what doctors would tell you not to eat. And we've learned that that may not be the case. So it's always evolving and we're learning new things and studies are supporting the things that we're you know, learning. Is there one approach or gateway thesis simple idea, easy button that we can all press to take that first step into incorporating the forward without the label. Because yes. I think labels get us all mix, messed up. What is yeah. something you can teach us in that, in that assignment? I think if we all went to a farm and we all harvest picked our food, there would be such a wonderful connection, not just with picking the food, but getting our hands in the soil. Right. And there's nothing like going on a farm or in your garden, in your garden. And when you taste that summer ripe tomato, it's simply a tomato. And Mother Nature has given it in this beautiful season of summer. It's at its ripest, its most nutritious, its sweetest. And you realize this is food. Marketers have labeled things. Activists have labeled things. But food, this bounty of color. And so I've worked on farms. I've had that privilege. And there's nothing like, and you know this, Jennifer, picking something right out of the ground, dusting it off. You, you know what you're planting your food in. And it's in. still so, warm from the sun. Yes. There is nothing even, and I know many of us get this, you know, from the farmer's market or from the grocery store and it's organic. There's nothing like, even if you plant your favorite herb in your own kitchen and cook with basil or cook with rosemary or cook with thyme, it's food. It's food for the gods and goddesses. So this time of year, I know I've mentioned this, but this time of year when you're in Southern Arizona or you're someplace warm and it's too hot to cook and it's too hot to eat, one of my go-to recipes this time of year is actually vegan. I never positioned it that way. I didn't even realize it until a couple of years ago. 
I take a gorgeous loaf of Don Guerra's Barrio bread. Now, of course, he just won the James Beard Award as best baker in the country, and he's just down the street. Slice those beautiful loaves, put a little olive oil, and grill them. Create a toast and top that with this mixture. Beautiful, ripe, fresh peaches. Again, if you can pick them yourself, even better. Heirloom tomatoes that have that real tomatoy flavor that actually tastes the way a tomato is supposed to taste. Slice them thinly. Spread them out on the largest, beautiful platter you can find so that it's almost a single layer of these beautiful slices overlapping like stained glass. Yeah. Drizzle it with good olive oil. Sprinkle it with a little bit of Maldon sea salt and fresh black pepper. And then chiffonade as many basil leaves as you can get your hands on. Yeah. sprinkle them all over the top. To me, when you let that rest and sit and realize as a dish what it has become yeah. so that it is now ready to scoop up and put on the toasted bread that you've just made, that is the kind of satisfying food that you can have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, but that would be so crunchy and rich and redolent with peachy, summery warmth and olive oil goodness that you don't miss a thing. You don't say, what's next? Where's my lamb chop? You might, if you're still hungry, but why wouldn't you want to have when they're in season, another one of these beautiful toasts with all those peaches and tomatoes on it? That's what I'm going to share with you. And I love that it's food to live for, not food to die for. It is. And there's, it's endless. I could go 365 days and give you those types of recipes in the season, local. You know, we talk about the blue zones. One thing was eating local um, and, and they had gardens or they had farms. They shared, not everybody can grow everything. People think, oh, it's so overwhelming. I can't grow all this. No, you'd grow the tomatoes. I'd grow whatever I'm growing, the lettuce, the cucumbers, and we would share. But there was this collaborative thing with the blue zones was the right tribe. So yes, food is so much to us, but you and me getting together is even more. You and me sharing life together is even more. And the food to me is the icing on the cake. Yes, for sustainability, but also for enjoyment. But it's you and me because if the food was just beautiful right. and there and you're eating it alone, I mean, we've experienced what that's like. That's why we've gotten on virtual parties through this season. That's the quantum vibration of the nutrition of the food that we eat that makes us who we are. That's yeah. the thing. I would be remiss, even though we've run out of the time that we've allocated for our conversation today, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the Blue Zones, Loma Linda, your work, your professional titles, your impact that you're having literally around the world, um, and how much of an enormous impact you're making you inspire me. You're one of my heroes. Can you talk a little bit about your work at Loma Linda? Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. I was asking, can you tell us a little bit about your work at mm -hmm. Loma Linda and the Blue Zones? Right. Well, I'm in Southern Cal excuse me, Northern California right now. And Loma Linda is in Southern California, one of the blue zones, the only blue zones in the United States. But you know, the work is really food is medicine. It's really getting people and even in hospitals where healthcare should be the first to be serving people food to live for. So that is the mission. And they're continuing that mission throughout the hospitals but then work outside because community is very important. So I'm going to be cooking at the Sacramento Tower Bridge dinner this year in September. This is my second year. I'm wearing and flagging, waving the plant-based banner. There's five courses, there's five chefs. I'm um, one female chef of the five, but I'm representing on many levels. You'll be proud of me, Jennifer. And I hope others, because we're going to be serving about 850 oh, people wow. on this bridge. And they've done it since 12, 213. 
And Jeremy Tower was um, one of their chefs that came in from San Francisco in the early days. Oh, so it's a wonderful celebration. It's farm to fork. Uh, Sacramento is the capital of farm to fork. So that's one of the things. And there's several pop-ups I'm going to be doing. So I'm just continuing to spread the love of food. You know, my dad says, you're only as good as your last plate. So every day I start all over and I decide who I'm going to be and how I'm going to show up. Well, tell so everybody so where we for can find me. you. Where can people get in touch with you and where can we learn more about what it is you do and where can we watch your new show? Because as far as I'm concerned, this should be the Hello Food Network, Hello Bravo, uh, Hello Discovery Network. Nina's ready for not only her close up, but our awakening as a food nation. I know that I speak for literally millions of people who say that I would love to see you on a show every week. Is that oh. possibly going to happen? <laughs> Jennifer, you know, I'm in, the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen, but I am excited to share with you. There is a new show that's going to be launching in September called Peeled or to the compost. And it's going to be, and I'm going to give you information because I want you to know about it, but it's, plant-based chefs coming together and competing. And oh, I great. think they're going to do it right. So I don't always have to be in front of the camera. My grandfather was a photographer. You couldn't wake up without a camera in your, a lens in your face. But I love the um, work behind the scenes. And if God's plan is for me to be in front of the camera, I'm here with you. So it's a blessing today. And I'm excited that I was able to come on. I read um, food and beverage every month, or as I get it, I go online, I'm on your Instagram, I stalk you. So I'm in love. So, you know, what we should do you and I should write an article about this to. moment in time, the green side of food 3.0. I would Let's love give to. the chefs a crystal ball glimpse of, of how green the crystal ball future of food is going to be done deal. All right. Chef Nina Curtis. Thank you so very much. Thank I'm you, so Jennifer. proud that you took time to be with us, and it's an honor to have you here. Thank you for all you're doing for our community and for representing as one of the leading women in the culinary industry today. You have made it to the top, and because you. you are here, young women, young chefs, and girls all over the world will see you and know that it's possible. So thank you for that. How did you meet these fantastic men? Ian, Paul, it's so lovely to have you here with us. Welcome. And I raise my glass to welcome you. Welcome. The incredible Vanessa Hudgens and Oliver Trevina. Hello and welcome. Hi. Cheers. Hi. How are you doing? I want to talk about the fact that the incredible Padma Lakshmi is joining us. Our extraordinary friend, Diane Mina, joins us from her home. Tower, who joins us today from his home in the beautiful Merida, Mexico. And he joins us now, Chef Ming Tsai. Aloha and welcome. What's going on, Jen? Good to see you. 